Hey, man. I had this crazy-ass dream that I talked to these Southern rappers, man. They were trying to school me on the game and shit, man. Check this shit out right here. At first I thought I was last of a dying breed. But rap's kind of thirsty and deep with a dying need. For a nigga such as you always spitting the truth. Took a nigga from Stuttgart, Arkansas to come through. School the young fools about the game of life and its barriers. And the future for us as a people really getting scary. Of knowing you can spit it to the fact they understand what it is to hold your own and be a man. You got it all in your hands. It's up to you to keep the cell phone locked and have niggas great as Jigga quoting verses from you, Doc. You got potential to be greater than Pac, so keep it real and put it down for your state. Now that's the motherfucking deal. Well, for I real. done seen a lot of rappers get big on fast kissing. But, boy, you wanna keep it real, that's what the game's missing. We gonna hold you down like family, man, till we decease. And if anybody hating, then we disturbing a peace. Hey, you're super cool and the threat at the same And I think it's about that time they seen your face hey, in the hey, game hey, hey, hey. It's pretty bold the way you're holding it, man I got to say you got it, potential it, to be it, one it, of the it, king it, it, Well, I'm glad to see you made it You're real and you're underrated Your rhythm's so colorful Not even club rocks can fade it Knew you was one of the greats The very first time that I played it The military got your back If somebody come trying to hate it Now, what it, no be respecting your mind You gon' shout And I'm thinking that you done hit the game around the right time Judging for from what I know about you, you's a dirty south soldier. Nothing but love and respect from real G's from the norm. Don't get caught up with all the rest of these niggas. Just keep doing what you be doing. That's collecting your figures. Stay focused on your career. Don't make no hectic decisions. A lot of slow shit up ahead, so play your move with precision. Okay. Now that was the magical, mystical music of the one and the only Arkansas Bo. Welcoming you all to the inaugural episode of Arkansas's Finest Sports po Podcast, brought to you by the I'm Just Saying Media Group. Allow me to introduce myself. I am your host, Patrick and Namdi Jeans Ali. Some of you may know me as your friendly neighborhood sports guy. At your hometown newspapers like the Stuttgart Daily Leader, the West Memphis, Crittenden County, Evening Times, and of course the Pine Bluff Commercial all of which, all of these formidable sporting communities I have been honored to serve over the years. But that was back when I had a full head of hair. Today, I'm taking an excursion from my regular crime-fighting duties to once again don the spectacles, come out of the phone booth, and resume the persona of a mild-mannered reporter and swing back into action as your friendly neighborhood sports guy. And not a moment too soon. As I look at the Arkansas sports media landscape today, it's as overpopulated as ever. However, in many ways, it's quite bleak. Now, back in the day, around the late 1990s, early 2000s, when I was prowling all over the Delta and Grand Prairie regions of Arkansas and covering everything from Little League Baseball to high school sports to writing regular columns about the Razorbacks, the good old boy, <laughs> that good old boy network pretty much had a lock on things. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been some good down-home grinders that I've come to respect over the years for the quality of their work and their integrity. Old school guys like Paul Lills, Harry King, Otis Kirk, Nate, the great Allen, and Dudley Dawson come to mind. But even some of the newer guys like Trey Biddy and Ty Hudson, they're out there doing good work. But for better or worse in Arkansas, the sports, the good old boys, they still run the show. And pretty much everybody bows down to Boss Hog on the hill in Fayetteville. Now, all you have to do is look at the people in prominent positions and asking the questions in the media rooms, and you'll see what I mean. However, advances in technology over the ensuing couple of decades has opened things up for more diverse perspectives. But again, that too has been for better or for worse. I mean, it's bad enough, the same old good old boys 
whose job it is to carry water for Boss Hog on the hill, still dominate the space. And over the years, they've played a vital role in running off every successful coach and some key players that could have made the Arkansas sports and basketball programs as consistently successful as many in the SEC. Now, I know some of you don't believe that. You'll say that it's impossible. But over the course of our journey here, and I'm just saying sports, we'll refute those talking points one by one. Now, to further complicate matters today, the aforementioned advances in technology and media consolidations have decimated the local news outlets that used to provide vital voices throughout the state, and they are being replaced by an invasion of artificial intelligence robots. Now, some of these programmable bots are carpetbaggers with little to no knowledge or connection to the state. They typically work for one of the big national news networks like ESPN and are subsidized by advertising revenue to push janky gambling schemes that provide kickbacks to their corporate sponsors and, of course, to carry water for Boss Hog on the Hill. Now, if all of that wasn't bad enough, I look up and guess who's popped up on the scene and set up shop? Who cares to do? Lord have mercy. Yes, that's right, y'all. It's Bebe's kids. Things have gotten so rough on the Arkansas sports media scene that Bebe's kids didn't open up a barbershop, y'all. Who cares to do? Small world, isn't it? Now, they're out here tearing up everything. I mean, just like Robin, Robin Harris said, just, just look at him. Look, look, look. <laughs> now, y'all know what Robin Harris said about, you can't take them badass kids nowhere. Now, they out here just being all messy. They done got all up in the locker rooms, getting all the dirt. Coming out here on the street, spreading all kind of gossip and rumors. And all y'all know is one thing these Arkansas Hogs cannot resist. Something they will fall for every time. It's a big mess of gossip and rumors. They will eat it up all day because they love it like a hog loves slop. Now then, to top all off all that, they're out here terrorizing these Mickey Mouse commentators and poor Disney characters like John Neighbors. I mean, just fuck Donald Duck up! <laughs> and it's all been spectacular to watch. But thanks primarily to the technical proficiencies of another product of Sugartown. Now that's Stuttgart without the T's for those of you who don't know. The technical proficiencies of one Oliver O.D. McCall, a.k.a. the bartender, has shown a lot of these better and better paid and better sponsored good old boys how to do a modern day podcast. So shout out to the guys over at the Woo Pig podcast. And I also want to give a shout out to my guy, SEC Mo, for what he's doing over there at the Hog Wild podcast. Now, they are here doing their thing. You know, they, they're, giving, they're giving these, you know, I got to give these guys props because if nothing else, they are entertaining. <laughs> Plus, Mo does a good job of breaking down highlights for the Razorbacks. And now he's uh, really doing a really nice job with a segment he does in the morning called the 22-minute min- drill. So y'all check, out, y'all check out all them boys, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, um, you know, y'all show them badass kids some love. Now, having said all that, y'all know your friendly neighborhood sports guy. The most censored man in Arkansas sports media history. Can't let all that lawlessness and chaos go unchecked. So I'm returning from exile to officially announce that your friendly neighborhood sports guy 
is once again back on the Arkansas sports media scene and not a moment too soon. Because the journey through the 2024 SEC football season campaign has only begun. And I come back to you now, a wildly old grizzled wizard should. I come back to you now at the turning of the tide. Because this Saturday at 2.30 p.m. in Dallas, Texas, in the Metroplex, deep in the heart of Texas, an old and bitter rivalry will once again be renewed as your beloved Razorbacks take on those ever annoying ass Aggies of Texas A&M. And what some would say would be the final showdown for the vaunted Southwest Classic title trophy in the house built by the modern day version of Boss Hogg himself. Yes, Jerry World, the, art the artist formerly known as Cowboy Stadium before the ball sold it out for a few dollars more to become known by its worn out corporate lease moniker of AT&T Stadium. It will host what some say will be the final neutral site battle in the Southwestern Classic. Now, I've yet to hear all week anywhere near of the belly aching and whining and complaining from Boss Hogg and his minions headquartered in Northwest Arkansas about playing a game once a year deep in the heart of Arkansas at historic War Memorial Stadium in Little Rock. Now, maybe that's because the Dallas Cowboys are Arkansas's unofficial professional franchise and a wholly owned subsidiary of Arkansas's favorite son, Jerry Jones, <laughs> the closest thing to a modern day Boss Hogg we have going today. He gets gifted an annual return on his relatively meager investments into the Razorback football program. But I digress. Let's take a look at how we got to where we are going into week two of the SEC football schedule. And this year's theme is a question of leadership. Now, after a disastrous 2023 campaign, our, be our beloved Razorbacks led by the triumvirate of head coach Sam Pittman and top lieutenants Bobby Petrino on offense and Travis Williams on defense went down to the plains of Auburn, Alabama to begin this SEC campaign with a victory most prognosticators did not see coming. So at the moment, the bipolar mood of many Razorbacks fans are on the upswing. However, that was not the case coming into the 2023 season. Because in 2023, not only did last football season, but basketball and baseball as well, all in, in a thudding whimper. And what was once considered the campus of champions, as we all witnessed, our beloved Razorbacks in each of the three major sporting campaigns and despite very talent-laden rosters, essentially lay down and quit. We will get into basketball and baseball in due season. But su suffice it to say for now, the time has come to get those questions answered for Razorback football. Now, coming out of the upset win at Auburn last Saturday, most of the questions around this year's Razorback football team still center around leadership. The transfer quarterback, Taylor Green, has shown flashes of the brilliance, but also struggled to fulfill the promise placed upon him to fulfill the perceived lack of leadership that derailed the 2023 football season. Now, Green has shown flashes of the ability that inspired such hope. However, he has also shown flashes that could spell doom ahead. Unless the leadership above him manages to live up to their responsibilities and give him the guidance and the support the promising young talent still obviously requires. However, some have a different perspective. 
like the voice of the Arkansas Razorbacks. Chuck Barrett has pronounced those questions have been answered just this week. On Wednesday, September 25th, Barrett said on his morning radio show with his co-host Bo Mattingly and guest Clay Henry, another long-standing good old boy, member of the club, this is what he said. I think because the they, offensive they've got line, the talent. I want to get your thoughts on this. I think the offensive line enjoys playing for Taylor perhaps more than last year's offensive line enjoyed playing for their quarterback. Yeah, and I think – there, there's more. There's, there's really something to that, uh, Chuck. You, you have to believe in your quarterback. You have to, and I can go back through history, man. That, that, that group. You know, in the late '80s, they loved playing for Quinn Groby. I mean, they really, really did. The guys knew Clint Sterner was going to make plays for, him. and I can go down the list. You know, all, you know, back to I just finished a, a long piece on on Bill Montgomery, and those guys trusted in and knew that that he would make plays for them, winning plays. So it, that, there's a lot to that, Chuck. And if you don't want to, if you don't want the leader to lead you. <laughs> then, then you've got problems. Well, so they... and, and 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 the reason I bring that up is not that they're that doesn't mean they're the finished product today, and it doesn't mean they'll be the finished product Saturday, but I think that gives them a chance to get to that point at some point this year. And I don't think they ever had a chance to get to that point last year. Well, when teams no. all over and the I, country are, are, are I think like yes, Hugh Freeze yeah, and yeah his I think that's right, and all I that think stuff, that's right. That, that, like that, the the chemistry of this team. And 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 we overlook, I think, sometimes Pittman going on and on about Talon's leadership and how he handles adversity and how he is on the sideline. I mean, these are these are not small things in terms of you know, getting better. Yeah, I want to throw something to you that that I was really, you know, I perked up because when Petrino got here uh, the first time, the the one of the things that he said right off the bat is. I don't want the players to be leaders. They need to follow the coaches right now. We're we're giving them something completely new. None of them have ever played in this kind of a system, and the details are incredibly important. They need to follow me. They need to follow Paul. They need to follow – and, you know, it went down the list of all their coaches, you know, Klinakis, the whole deal. So if they do that, we'll be fine. I don't want them leading. And so I asked him if they were in that same boat last spring, and he goes, no. And I was like, well, why, coach? And he says, you're putting in a new system. He says, we've got leaders. So I didn't know if we had leaders before, but we're able to spend more time with them in this bunch. And he went down the list. He said, this guy's a leader. This guy's a leader. He's leading his position group. I mean, Carmona, he said he is a tremendous leader. So when you have leadership within the team, that helps. In other words, that there's you got little micro groups that have leaders and it helps the chem, the chemistry you know, you know Clay, the, last year the, the coach the, trusts them yeah at, cool. the a, at the a&m game i'm on the sideline in the same game last year and i hear i won't say who it was but somebody significant was talking to somebody else significant on the sideline they were just observing the game and they said this team lacks leadership and i i will i just i remember that i was just like wow how, like and that was a that was a contested game last year. Luke Haas got hurt. All they just didn't have the same thing. Look now, if any of you out there are familiar with your friendly neighborhood sports guy, you know I still have a couple of axes to grind in regards to the leadership of Razorback Nation. So let me take this opportunity to add some much needed perspective on what we just heard and how we come to find ourselves where we are going into this Saturday's contest with Texas A&M. Because what you just heard there is just a continuation of a deliberate and sustained media campaign to smear one of the greatest contributors to the Arkansas football program in its history. So, now if any of you out there hollering, man, why don't you just let it go? Well, I'm not letting it go because I'm standing on this. The leadership problems at Arkansas are still here. And until they clean up their act, Arkansas Athletics will continue to hold itself back. Now, just as I was saying, going into last season, our man Sam 
Samwise Pittman, the game G, made the rather rash and fateful decision to preemptively part ways with the offensive coordinator he brought to Arkansas in one Kendall Browse in mid-January of 2023. Despite having just signed a new contract only weeks prior, or his agent, Browse or his agent persistently kept flirting with other suitors around the country, and someone on the Hill got the bright idea to replace him on short notice in favor of a poster boy for good old boy mediocrity in Dan Enos. Now, Enos proceeded to pick up where he left off in his previous tenure as Razorback Offensive Coordinator and lead the Razorback offense to supersede the levels of ineptitude he had in his first tenure into levels of dysfunction rarely seen anywhere before. Under Enos' guidance, the Razorback offense regressed dramatically in every aspect, not just passing, but running efficiency, run and pass blocking, turnovers, and penalties. During the offseason, and let me say something before we go on with that. You know, I do sort of chalk that whole thing up to the fact that, you know, Enos was brought in a little late. He came in with a completely different um, blocking scheme. Uh, you know, he, he styles himself as a pro, uh, pro style offense, although he's never played or coached in the NFL. And everywhere he's coached in, in, at the college level, He's either gotten fired himself or gotten his head coach fired and subsequently himself. So, you know, so much for the idea that he's somehow this pro passing guy when he's not. And um, but still, I think, you know, there were a lot of things that played there. I think, uh, you know, Enos was going through a divorce. You know, uh, Pittman was out recruiting in Maryland where, you know, he was coaching pr prior and right about that time, their coach was getting let go. And these uh, articles started popping up in the paper about um, Brow still, you know, generating interest from other teams. Now, that was probably his uh, agent, um, you know, um, just trying to get him a better deal. But the bottom line is, you know, Pittman and, 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 and his regime had come in and really kind of restored things at Arkansas. And... They had a little down year. They were nine and four a couple years ago. Then they went down to seven and six. And then coming into this year, when everybody thought it was the year because they had a lot of injuries uh, uh, that, that previous year. But they still had the core of their team back, added some nice pieces through the transfer portal and everything. And everybody figured that, you know, especially with Alabama kind of seem, seeming uh, a little vulnerable at the time that, you know, th that was going to be Arkansas's year. And, of course, it didn't happen that way, but I just wanted to kind of go into some of that to say, you know, Enos is okay. He's just um, mediocre. He wasn't anything special. However, the guy he replaced had had continual success throughout his time with Pittman. So why would you? get rid of the guy. He had just signed a new contract. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't leave unless you released him. So going into that third year with your senior quarterback leading the show, why would you just jump up and get the guy? It was an emotional reaction. Either Sam or Hunter or somebody got in their feelings about it and wanted the guy fired. The guy was still on the staff when they let him go. You know? And uh, he went to a team that, you know, went to the national championship, you know, before. And, you know, he's still, you know, kind of still doing his thing uh, with TCU where he is now. But we brought in Enos and it was a complete and utter disaster. And it was nobody's fault except for the leadership. They are the ones that made that decision when they did not have to. Anyway, I digress. During the offseason, a narrative emerged about the need for a new leadership on the Hill. Most of these talking points were directed at the now-exiled Golden Knight and Razorback football all-time leading passer, one K.J. Jefferson. The former four-star recruit out of Sardis, Mississippi, 
who chose to come to Arkansas despite offers from other SEC programs like his home state schools in Mississippi and perennial national championship contenders like the Georgia Bulldogs. Still, KJ came to Arkansas and led the Razorback back from the bleak Chad Morris area where the Razorbacks rarely competed, more or less could win games in the nation's most powerful conference. In his first two years as a starting quarterback at Arkansas, Jefferson not only led the Razorbacks back to respectability in the SEC and regular rankings in the, in the national polls, but back-to-back -back bowl victories and winning records. And in the process, Jefferson positioned himself to break every meaningful passing record in the history of the Razorback football program, a long and storied history, I may add. And not only that, he set himself up to be a potential high-round NFL draft pick, according to most NFL draft experts going into, 20, going into the 2023 season. In Arkansas, as a team, was picked by many to be a dark horse pick to win the SEC West and make the final SEC championship game, or at least when they had the conferences set up. Jefferson even was mentioned by some observers to be on the watch list for the vaunted Heisman Trophy. And as we all know, the hiring of Enos flipped the script. And Jefferson, who was forced to refute unsourced reports in the media by reporters like Chris Hummer and Matt Zenith of 24-7 Sports, an affiliate, affiliate of CBS Sports, that he wanted out of Arkansas for his final season of el eligibility. So let's revisit that. Now, this is the scene. Enos was fired with about two or three games left in the season. KJ and the Razorbacks still had a chance to make a bowl. They went down to Florida with, you know, the interim offensive coordinator, Kenny Guyton, and beat Florida in Florida, which is something the Razorbacks rarely, if ever, have done. And they were in a position to, um, you know, get that bowl and kind of salvage the season because, you know, throughout the season, despite the disaster that particularly the offensive line was, because – I definitely need to make this point and emphasize this. Now, I've watched football at every level for a lot of years, all my life. I mean, I was five, six years old. I mean, as long as I can remember, I was watching football. And I was one of those kids that, at that age, I knew every player on every team in the NFL. And, you know, I've been a football freak all my life. Now, in all those years... I have never, particularly at the um, college, you know, major college or even smaller college and particularly the professional level, never seen such an atrocious and terrible offensive line play in my life. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not saying that to be hyperbolic or anything. I am dead serious. I have never seen an offensive line play that bad Consistently, game after game, and throughout the season. It was mind-blowing. And when you consider the fact that Arkansas was being led by an offensive line guru, supposedly, and his right-hand man as, as the offensive line coach. Now, even with um, Enos is calling them peewee football plays, he was out there calling. I mean, if... The line had just continued to run block would have made a huge difference. And God forbid, you know, they do any pass blocking, which I don't, I would say KJ never had the best pass protection the whole time he was at Arkansas. And of course that year it was, I mean, it, it was just really bad. But even with all of that, you know, they still were in position to salvage the season and make a bowl game. And a lot of the games they won up to that point, I mean, they lost up to that point in the SEC were close games that they could have won despite just an awful offense. Now, after the Florida game, inexplicably, the team quit. 
You can call it what you want to. Not only offense never really showed up much the whole season, but the defense even quit. And even some of the linebackers, you know, started talking about, you know, the guys just quit. And I know there's that narrative out there. Well, it was KJ's fault. You know, he was he he wasn't mad after the losses, and he was shaking hands with the players and all that. Get over yourself. It's called good sportsmanship. Okay, he was after the season. Nearly all of the Arkansas sports media, and eventually Sam Pittman himself, made it clear that the school's all-time leading passer was no longer welcome at Arkansas. And keep in mind. When Petrino was first brought back, that's when the rumors started coming out. Oh, KJ wants to leave. He 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 wants to hit the portal. KJ had to come out and say, "Oh, that's not true. I haven't made up my mind yet." I think KJ wanted to, you know, sit back and uh, meet with Petrino, talk to him, see, you know, if if they can work together. Because unlike how most of the narrative was going around here at Arkansas at the time, they were running around saying things like. Oh, he, he's not a Bobby Petrino quarterback. And then somebody in the room would kind of eventually tap him on the shoulder and be like, well, you know, he did um, uh, have uh, lead um, Lamar Jackson to a Heisman Trophy at, um, at Louisville. And then they kind of catch themselves. Be like, oh, yeah, uh, okay, uh-huh. You, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> but we'll get to it in a minute. But think about, like now, where we are. If we had a quarterback like KJ, who didn't turn the ball over, who completed 60, you know, well, north of 65% of his passes for his career, who was efficient, who took care of the ball, who managed the game, and then made big plays down the field into the tight ends. Hmm, where would we be? I wonder. Anyhow, at that point, Jefferson finally entered his name into the transfer portal where, we event, where he eventually landed with former Razorback offensive coordinator, national champion at Auburn, and Arkansas native Gus Malzahn and the Golden Knights of Central Florida. Now, meanwhile, back home, the, the natives were growing increasingly restless through every Shire, village, town, and city. The Razorbacks welcomed back the once, and some say future king of Razorback football fortunes in Bobby Petrino, in a brilliant but desperate move by the Arkansas athletic director, Hunter Juracek. The move not only saved the job of, Ur of Juracek's hand-picked man to lead the football program, it, it also saved a hefty buyout that would have been owed to Pittman and what was likely to be an even heftier contract for a replacement. With Petrino back in the fold, the narrative handed down from on the hill congealed around the need for new leadership in the Razorback football team, although most of the leadership was still there. You have figures like Mike Neighbors, one of Arkansas's most senior sports writers, to a group thinking consensus down at the Woo Pig Barbershop all concluded it was not Enos, but Jefferson's poor leadership, which was to blame for the regression of the Razorbacks' offense in 2023. The word on the hill was that Jefferson's team teammates were, were resentful of his new cars and fine clothes his name, image, and likeness deal had afforded him. Now, to put it on, in street parlance, they were player-hating and pocket-watching. That's that's that was the narrative. Well, well, because he was a bad leader, because he wouldn't take him out to dinner, he didn't buy watches for the offensive line or something, and all this kind of mess. You know, they didn't like the fact that he had a new suit when he came to the games. He bought him a new sports car, and they this uh, his teammates just couldn't take it. Now, all these prior years, Jefferson. Never, we never heard anything about any leadership issues with Jefferson. However, once he kind of, you know, got a, got his little strut on, getting ready, get ready for to go to the NFL and practice that lifestyle, all of a sudden, here come all the haters out the woodworks. Now, 
Let me say this too, right? Personally, I don't believe that nonsense. I find it very hard to believe that other guys who have NFL hopes and prospects themselves would put on tape what they put on tape because somehow they were jealous and wanted to sabotage the quarterback? Did they not have enough sense, enough own self-preservation to realize that I'd be hurting myself? And on top of that, what about future recruits? If the narrative gets out that Arkansas, when you get at Arkansas and you're successful, you come here, we're always, you know, saying how much we need to get kids from surrounding states to come here to Arkansas, four- and five-star recruits like Jefferson. He comes here, brings the program back up, gets us back on the national stage, positions himself to make the NFL, which all the players want to do, leave the school, breaking all the records, and he's a bum? He's no good? He's not a leader? What do you think that is telling other recruits? Now, let's get something straight here. This isn't coming from me. This is coming from Boss Hall and the people on the hill. And I'm going to show you how dim-witted these idiots really are. They somehow think in their minds it's making them look good and making KJ look bad. No, Sam Wise. Well, I don't want to put that on Sam because I think Sam is kind of caught up in the politics of it. And it's really the good old boy network in Arkansas that Sam works for that this is coming from. But they think that it's not making them and the program look bad. Well, I have news for you, gentlemen, or ladies and gentlemen, whatever the case may be. You're only sabotaging yourself. Okay, so don't try to point blame at KJ or me or anybody else for pointing out how stupid you really are. But anyway, I digress. Now, these anonymous sources close to the program said teammates were so offended that Jefferson, in a three year as starter, didn't share his hard earned bounty with teammates that they refused to block for him. That sentiment must have been extended to tailback Rocket Raheem Sanders and the rest of the backfield that many consider to be the best running back room in the country. Now, Sanders ended up sitting out most of the season with a the, with the lingering injury, suffered early on in 2023. This was after failing to see any of the running room against preseason cupcakes, to say nothing of SEC defenses. He had grown, which he had grown accustomed to in previous years. But this brings us back to our man Sam, Samwise Pittman, Samwise Gamgee, the best offensive line whisperer in the country, the transplant Oki, who reportedly fell so in love with the lakeside rolling Ozark foothills and home brewed L's off Bathhouse Row in Hot Springs during his tenure as offensive line coach under Arkansas's Previous coach, Brett Bielema, back from 2013 to 2015, when Enos was there, that he manifested his dream job as head coach of Arkansas in 2019. Now, going into this week's game with a and Sam Wise said in, regard, in regards to Green's struggles so far in 2024, well, you know, I think a lot of that a lot of it, we are not protecting him as good as we should. And he's running all over the place. I think once we can protect him better, I think Luke has will show up a bunch. I talked to Coach Petrino about that today, as a matter of fact. And we have several plays called where he's the target, meaning highs. It's just that sometimes the play is called and the quarterback has to run all over the place. We know how valuable Haas is. We certainly know his value, and we're trying to use that value. We'd be silly not to. 
But for some reason, when it, when he's the first read, we've had protection breakdowns. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? As bad as it was a year ago, before he went out with an injury, Jefferson managed to find him. Imagine that. That sounds like a lot of a year ago when Jefferson routinely managed to get the ball to the talented tight ends like Haas and Ty Washington before both went out early in the season with season-ending shoulder injuries. Still, somehow, without them, and by far his worst showing as Razorback quarterback, Jefferson somehow still managed to complete over 60% of his passes and minimize turnovers. Of course, all that is a far cry from Jefferson's first year as starter under Pittman and Browse. Starting with Jefferson's ascension as Arkansas quarterback, it seems Samwise was on the cusp of realizing his promise to return the Razorback football program to prominence before retiring to his lakeside villa to live happily ever after to the end of his days. With Jefferson at the quarterback, an offensive line guru in Pittman as head coach, along with another highly regarded NFL prospect in Sanders at running back, and newcomer Andrew Armstrong positioned to pick up at receiver where the NFL's Traylon Burks and Matt Landers left off, no one could have predicted the complete and utter disaster the Arkansas offense became last season under Enos. However, that's exactly what happened. I'll spare you the rest of the ugly details because I know Razorback Nation is still suffering from PTSD. But suffice it to say, much of the Hog fan base, led by prominent voices like Erwin and Barrett to the Woo Pig podcast, act, acted like the proverbial swine and turned on Jefferson and tore his reputation to pieces. Now, I don't want anybody out there to take this personal. I'm not calling anybody swine. I'm speaking figuratively, of course. I mean, we're all hog fans here, right? We're all Razorbacks, after all. However, if the cloven-footed shoe fits, wear it. With Sanders and Jefferson now off to finish their college careers at new destinations via the transfer portal, and Petrino back in the scene, Razorback Nation comes into game two of the real season by once again renewing an old and bitter rivalry. Last week's win at Auburn certainly is a cause for optimism throughout Razorback Nation, but it's still worth pointing out that many of the same Razorback fans who complain about playing a game in Little Rock each year are more than happy to give Boss Hogg his annual kickback in Texas. And it's still worth mentioning that many of the same people who tell me to let go of the despicable treatment Boss Hogg and his minions can't seem to help throw at someone like K.J. Jefferson, every chance they get, they want to tell me to let it go. But I will for now. Let's leave it at that. Now, this year's team comes into week two of SEC play with a pair of SCS wins over the once mighty but now bottom-feeding Golden Lions of Arkansas Pine Bluff and the Blazers of Alabama-Birmingham. But in their game two loss at Stillwater, Oklahoma, the Razorbacks continued a trouble, troubling and recurring theme of the Sam Pittman era by finding exhaustive ways to lose a game they otherwise were in great position to win. Even in week three's pre-conference finale, Sam's Hogs continued another perplexing tendency of playing down to the level of their opponents against the Blazers. But things were made right in most respects when the Razorbacks opened up conference play with an upset win at Auburn, thanks mostly to the inspired defensive effort led by first-year safety T.J. Metcalf's breakout performance and, I must add, uh, Auburn, former Auburn player, graduate coach, Terrence, uh, Travis Williams, who went down there to the Plains in Jordan Hare and put one on his old alma mater. Good job, T. Will. However, on the offensive side of the ball, consistent 
inspirational leadership is still very much a question. Green was Petrino's hand-picked successor to replace Jefferson, and he did put up impressive numbers in his first two games as Arkansas's starting quarterback. However, he has struggled in the last two games against UAB and Auburn and looked more like the guy who lost his job to a freshman a year ago in the FCS Mountain West, despite what Barrett would have you all believe. However, upon his arrival on the hill in Fayetteville, Green was universally hailed as a great leader with everything he needs to lead the Razorback offense to respect back to respectability. There were only a few skeptics like myself questioning what questioning that here in Arkansas. There were only a few skeptics like myself questioning that here in Arkansas. But many national observers were scratching their heads. And let me be clear. I can see why Petrino hitched his wagon to the 6'6 quarterback with 4'4 speed from Dallas. Although I was initially skeptical, Green has already proven to me he's worthy of comparisons to Razorback legend Matt Jones. His running style and playmaking ability are reminiscent of Jones. However, so is his passing. But anyone who rightly holds Jones in high regards for his performances at Arkansas shouldn't be so quick to discount Green's ability to replicate those feats. He has the gifts to be, to go on and live up to the high, expecta high expectations placed on his shoulders. Now, whether he will ultimately do that or not remains to be seen. But I would be rooting for him and Pittman and Petrino and the rest of the team all the rest of the way. I'm not one to get down on a kid after a bad game or two, just like I believe it was wrong to trash Jefferson and Sanders after bad seasons that they had a year ago, which was clearly not their fault. The fact is, Green was bought in and put in a tough position because the leadership at Arkansas proved once again to be a bunch of ingrates for their treatment of the school's all-time leading passer. Now, for pointing that out, your friendly neighborhood sports guy was kicked off the Razorback Nation Facebook page on Thanksgiving! <laughs> on Thanksgiving of last year. Your friendly neighborhood sports guy was kicked off of the Facebook page for saying they should give thanks. They should appreciate what Jefferson and Jevo Davis did for Arkansas. But what it was really for is I was calling out Boss Hogg and the Swineherd and reminding them all that they should be thankful what those young men brought to Arkansas Athletics. In today's world of college football, no one would have a problem if a guy leaves after a rough season to rebuild his reputation. But to dismiss all the accomplishments, sacrifices, and yes, leadership Jefferson displayed in his three years as starter here in Arkansas is like my old army sergeant used to say, son, you're as wrong as two boys holding hands. It's one thing to wish Jefferson well and to move on. But as we can see, the bosses on the hill never miss an opportunity to keep throwing their little slick shots at Jefferson's legacy. And it always amazes me how they never fail to connect their own antics with Jefferson, with Arkansas's, I'm sorry, with Arkansas's inability to keep in-state talent or attract top talent from surrounding areas. That's why I call them out every chance I get for exactly what they are, a bunch of ingrates who enjoy, enjoy all the bounty and benefits and the blessings of Arkansas. But when it's required of them to reciprocate, they're hogs, just hogs. And they have a history of tarnishing the reputations of some of the greatest figures in Razorback sports history. And we'll get into that over the course of, of, of the podcast here at Arkansas's Finest Sports Podcast. 
But for now, suffice it to say, there remains a leadership question on the Hill, and the questions still need to be answered from figures in more prominent positions than Green. It's obvious, so far at least, that the problems on the Arkansas offensive line and the perceived ones at quarterback have not fully been answered despite Jefferson's departure and Sam Pittman's and Sam Pittman's inability to fix those lingering missed assignments up front and Petrino's inability to fix them at quarterback remain, like their jobs, very much in question. Well, Samwise, looks like you and your bosses still have some leading to do. No more cupcakes. The real 2024 football season is here. And any questions of leadership at Arkansas should be directed squarely where they belong, the adults in the room. No more low-key slick shots at KJ and Devo. No more deleting Twitter accounts because trolls are calling your names. No more Enos defending his ineptitude with fans online. And please, no more neck braces. If you're concerned about your mental health, you might want to consider retirement. There's no shame in it. Better coaches than you and better sports writers than Irwin have already bowed out of today's college football world. And players under your guidance, and they need you to lead them not only in football, but off the field as men. If you intend to finish the quest you started and become the most unlikeliest of heroes here at Arkansas, you will have to face your demons. These proverbial hogs are turning to you once again and looking for leadership. And it's incumbent on you. Samwise Gamgee, and to you, Hunter Yurichek, and Bobby Petrino, and Travis Williams, to realize there is something good in the world of big-time college football, and it's still worth fighting for. That is the task appointed to you. Be the leader. Don't point fingers. Hold yourselves accountable. Three years ago, with Jefferson at the helm, the Razorback won all three trophy games, as we call them here in the natural state. One of them is on the line on Saturday. Hell, yeah. those hogs, led by Jefferson and Pittman, even throwed in a thumping of the Texas Longhorns in a major bowl victory just to sweeten the pot. It wasn't that long ago that Eurocheck presided over what he called the Campus of Champions. Last year changed all that. But like any true Razorback fan, I never give up on my hogs. We can get headed back in the right direction. But remember one thing, as I often like to quote, a good craftsman never blames his tools. Hunter and Sam have proven they know how to handpick the tools to get it takes to make the Razorbacks competitive again in the SEC and the country. However, what they haven't proven is that they can win championships. Until next time, this is Arkansas's finest sports, sports podcast, and I'm just saying. It's full of fakes, my nigga, you gotta stay on your toes Forget about them parties, stay focused, fuck drugs and hoes Gotta keep a clear head and don't forget about your folks It's the beginning of your career, cause slowly be coming to a close Now let me touch on that, from the word go, there's no coming back We paved the way for you to put your state up on the map Kick the truth to the truth about future, bro, it's all divine No need for wishing you luck, boy, you got undeniable shine Shout it, a real cool ass nigga scratching and surviving Bringing something to the game to keep this thing live, man Keep spitting fire and continue on and spying to the consumers of this art like expressions and so keep trying them. You got a spark, dude. Shouting out the dark, dude. A monster in these waters of rap. These niggas sharks, fool. Your flow's crazy. You got it. It's all gravy. You're proving from Weezy, baby. Please see the baby. You got it, my nigga. The game is yours. The flow is hot. A star is born. Just wait. 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 Start smashing shows and killing them To know they had my back was just pumping up my adrenaline The whole world knew about Bo and everyone was feeling them Oh shit, oh fuck that Oh fuck Oh shit Let me get the fuck up Turn that